I graduated from Ohio State in um, December of 74 and worked for a small flooring company. And uh, the, the, the flooring company was uh, sole proprietorship. The sole proprietor had passed away and passed it on to one of his sons. And let's just say it was more than a frustrating experience uh, being there. In fact, uh, actually, when I told them that I was leaving and coming to this job, everybody went on vacation. The salesman, the, the, uh, the son who was running the business, and I ended up uh, running the organization from uh, 7 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night for two weeks while everybody was on vacation. So it was a frustrating experience where I was, and I was kind of looking for another job, but really hadn't put a resume together or anything along those lines. And um, the story goes this way. Tom Slummer had put an application in the uh, Columbus Dispatch for an accountant to come to work for National Church of Since All the accounting was being done out of Waverly, Ohio at the time. And he got uh, in excess of a uh, of 100 applications. And um, went to a, uh, he was part of a, a church, uh, actually my brother's now the pastor of that church, but he was par part of a home group within that church. And he mentioned to the home group uh, folks that he needed some uh, prayer in terms of going through those 100 plus applications and finding the right guy to come into an organization of 50 people at the time to, uh, to be their accountant. And um, after the meeting was over with, uh, a friend that I'd worked with in Young Life, a guy by the name of Dale Dieger, went up to him and said, I know two guys that might be interested, Robin Peterfee and Joe Casper. Well, Robin was the best man at my wedding. And Robin had just taken a job at, uh, at uh, one of the local banks here. Uh, Tom did approach him first. Uh, I'm not quite sure why he picked Tom, Robin over me, but he did pick Robin. And Robin kind of turned him down. And so uh, he gave me a call and I said, you know, I might be interested. And he picked me up at the house and we went out to uh, Stigler Village, uh, which had been open less than a year, and uh, toured that and we talked. And uh, after about five or six other interviews, he actually hired me. And when they went to give me my first paycheck, they literally did not have an application uh, for me on file and had, I had to fill out an application two weeks after I was hired and fill out, of course, my, my W-4 form and, and all the different paperwork. Uh, but they did not have an address for me for my first paycheck. So I always uh, tell people that it's uh, not coincidence that I'm here. It's by providence that I'm here and uh, that I never, ever applied for this job that I've been at for now for 35 years. I've been working in a, uh, a small uh, flooring uh, company, uh, basically a remodeling company, and I did some new construction work. So I spent my first year building, uh, building my knowledge of HUD and how HUD uh, facilities worked. Uh, one of my first experiences was that the um, lady, uh, I had, had a lady come out from HUD to review the files at Stigler Village, and she came back and said that she didn't like the way we documented medical expenses and kind of wrote us up for that, kind of dinged us for that. So I called her up on the phone and I, I went to Tom and I said, well, what do I do? And he says, I don't know. And he said, give her a call. So I call her up on the phone and uh, she says, well, I don't like the way you did it, but I can't tell you how I want, to, want you to do it. So just try a couple of different ways and we'll find one we eventually like. And that's what we eventually did there. But it gave me a pretty good understanding that, um, you know, HUD can do anything to you, HUD can do anything for you. Or maybe I should say the bureaucracy can do anything to you, the bureaucracy can do anything for you. So I spent lots of time reading HUD documents, reading HUD manuals, and eventually uh, putting together a manual of how to operate a uh, affordable housing facility. Uh, similar uh, similar uh, uh, experience that we had when we opened Sharpsburg Tower in 1980. I'd been here a couple of years by that time. And we used to collect a $25 application fee on every application just to make sure that the applicant was serious about putting in their application. We were going to waste a lot of time uh, interviewing somebody and then finding out they really weren't interested in moving. And the uh, gentleman who was uh, overseeing that project for HUD in Pittsburgh called up and said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, where in any regulations does it say I can't do this? And he says, well, it's in your regulatory agreement, you know, section K number 32 or whatever it was in the particular thing, particular line item. I don't remember the exact reference today. He would sit back and say, uh, it's, and the line says, or any other thing that might be objectionable to the secretary of HUD. And he said, this is ex uh, objectionable to the secretary. So I asked if I could talk to the secretary. Of course, he just laughed and he said, no, it's objectionable to me. Therefore, it's objectionable to the secretary. We had to give back all those $25 application uh, fees that we had collected.
The first office that I worked at at National Church of Residences was at uh, um, 1831D Northwest Boulevard here in Columbus, and it was a two-bedroom townhouse. Uh, the upstairs bedroom, the, uh, the kind of the larger bedroom up there was John Glenn's office, uh, the president of the organization at the time. Uh, the secretary's office was a smaller bedroom. The, uh, the bathroom had a board literally across the tub with a copier on it. So God help you for going to the bathroom and you need to make copies. Or they were making copies and you needed to go to the bathroom and it went both ways. Uh, Tom Slummer had the living room, uh, I had the dining room, and there was a small strip kitchen uh, on that floor, and then the basement had uh, kind of two rooms in the basement, and the secretary, the administrative assistant, was in the basement. And uh, I always jokingly say my first, first duty was to turn the tea water off when it, when it whistled, uh, because we didn't have a coffee maker back in the day, it was all instant coffee, and, and literally the coffee coffee uh, whistled. And the Columbus office at that time had five people in it. You pretty much did everything. So um, I literally uh, managed, pro uh, managed projects. I managed Stigler Village, Lincoln Gardens, uh, uh, and eventually Sharpsburg Tower. Uh, we put together applications uh, on the floor of the office building. Uh, literally there wasn't any desk or office space to do it. You just laid it out on the floor and you sat there on the floor and collated it, put it together and put it in the binder. Uh, we did uh, all of the accounting was done on punch cards. The information was sent to a, uh, a computer company. They uh, put together punch cards, ran them through the system. Out came your financial statements, and God help you if they were too far off because you had to kind of manually correct them. And then we typed up uh, the financial report for the board or, or anybody we needed to send it out, out to. We did that for about six months before um, that uh, company actually got tired of doing punch cards and got tired of uh, paying the uh, person to punch the cards and they uh, brought a little uh, computer writer in, you ran a uh, green bar paper through it, green bar paper, everybody laugh if we talk about green bar paper today, we ran green bar paper through these um, keyboards basically that sat on the floor and uh, typed in all the information and uh, I started here in uh, September and uh, April 1st we did our first payroll that way. Uh, I was employee number 49 and a part-time uh, uh, young high school girl we brought in to do some typing uh, for us into the computer. She was employee number 50 and we produced our first payroll on April 15th uh, with that process. And uh, then the next June began doing financial statements. Uh, when the fiscal year end passed we let it take place to the old system and then began the new system here and drove the people in Waverly crazy that were actually doing the accounting at the time. They felt like we were taking all the control away from them, so it was kind of fun. In May of 1979, uh, we opened uh, Bristol Court. It was 38-unit 30, apartment building, uh, and uh, I had literally gone down and done all of the certifications of those 38 residents. Uh, 37 of them I had met, the 38th was actually in a nursing home and, and her family uh, did all the paperwork for her, so I'd never actually met her. I guess maybe in June or July when we had did the first residence association meeting, I stood up in front of the um, residents and introduced all 37 residents mm -hmm. at that meeting and told a little something about every one of them. I'm not sure today as I sit here with 3,000 residents, 3,000 employees, that I could introduce 37 employees and tell you something about them. And uh, that's what I miss most about the, the growth of the organization is not getting out and being able to meet the residents anymore. I sit in my office and look at a lot of schedules and a lot of checks and a lot of vouchers and a lot of plans and, and business plans for, for different buildings and that's what I spend my time doing today. What was John Glenn like? You know, he was a very interesting individual. He was a pastor. And, um, you know, I've been involved in church for all my life, and, you know, pastors have a kind of a different way about them, and it isn't always business-like. You know, it really tends to be more about people, and John was always about people. And John was always about trying to do something good for people. And we, we, we um, he was an entrepreneur in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a way, but not necessarily that one plus one always equaled two. You know, John's greatest moment was actually buying Bristol Village. He needed $50,000 to, to put in a bid on the property. And I don't know if many people know this story, but John raised fifteen dollars and put $35,000 of his own money into that, into that deposit and into that bid. 
He raised 10, uh, 10 locally and, and five, uh, 10 locally in Waverly, five here in Columbus, and, and raised the other 35 uh, by borrowing money on his own home uh, to get that done. And so talk about John's greatest moment getting Bristol Village and started this organization. Started in 1961, Bristol Village, uh, he won the bid in late 61 and then opened the village actually in 62 and people started moving in there. John would go to uh, the, the local uh, uh, nursery at the end of the year and there would be all these bulbs left and they'd be selling them for a dollar a piece and John would walk into the Frank's nursery and he'd say, how about giving us those bulbs? We could use them down in Waverly. Or at the end of the season, you get the, 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 the um, roses uh, that were left over and hadn't been sold, and he'd get Frank's nursery to give them to him for free. And uh, even after he retired, he was one of these guys that would, uh, would go to the, the local grocery store. And as they were throwing out the expired bread, and I guess bakery products, as there were cakes and, and uh, pies as well, he would get those, and he would drive into the smaller poor sections of town. I guess he was kind of even known for this on a Saturday morning. He'd honk his horn and all the people would come on out and they'd take that expired day old bread or whatever you call it and, and, and pies and cakes and pass them out. And he was doing that well after he retired. But that was kind of his typical way. The energy crisis uh, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s took place and you know John went and bought, uh, got, got uh, all these uh, thermal underwear for a buck and we'd be selling it for three bucks at the various projects at the time. But that was just John, always caring about people, always trying to find a good deal, and always trying to pass it on to, to people who were less fortunate than, than he was. Now, my impression of Tom has proved to be true. He wants everything yesterday. He is uh, one of these entrepreneurial type of guys that, that doesn't take can't or won't for an answer. Uh, we keep going after, uh, after uh, uh, all sorts of various facilities that, uh, and, and programs and projects. And he's one of these guys, he, he wants it all yesterday. Um, doesn't understand why it can't be done five minutes ago rather than uh, five days from now. And uh, has built this organization in many ways uh, from what it was. I can remember that uh, sitting there doing, saying, uh, putting together 31 applications for 202s. Now putting an application together for a 202, each application is probably four inches uh, four inches thick, and typically you got to turn in about 10 of those, and then you're doing it for 31 different organizations, and then having to follow through when you win 13 of those to actually get a building built. Uh, it takes a lot of time, effort, and push to get that done. And uh, that's how this organization's been built. And living off of the management fees of those, of those properties, there was no developer fee, there was no money coming on the development side of these projects. It was all on the um, on the operations side. We couldn't take any cash flow out, so if we made a nickel, we had to put it into the project. And if we lost a nickel, well, God help us, uh, we had to make it up the next year somehow. I think Tom's had lots of finest moments over the years. I think getting together a great board is one of the finer moments, and probably one of the one I, ones I think we would point to that really was a changing point in this organization is when we began to do uh, uh, housing for the homeless. City of Columbus came to us, asked us to do that. Uh, we kind of said, geez, it's really not in our wheelhouse. They came back and said, hey, look, you guys run great projects uh, when it comes to senior housing with services. We want you to do the affordable, or do the, uh, the, the homeless housing here. Permanent supportive housing is what we call it, although it's homeless housing in terms of this tape for people to understand what we're doing. But uh, that really brought together uh, a lot of parties to building a facility with no debt, mm -hmm. with enough service dollars coming in to really do it and do it correctly, and with enough reserves in case some of the funding fell out that we had the money to, to, to uh, make this thing successful. Mm -hmm. We did our first facility, and I really encouraged us on how to bring services into senior housing and then to begin to look at the uh, other needs that seniors had in the community. And so we did adult daycare when it came along. Uh, we've done the, the nursing homes. I think we've done them well. We've done home community-based services well now. Uh, but I think that was a real turning point in terms of uh, one of the big turning points. We were experiencing you know, growth of 1,500 units, new units a year. We were bringing on all sorts of new services. And all of a sudden, uh, kind of the world stopped. Uh, in terms of fun, uh, funding. Uh, the banks weren't lending any money. 
uh, for real estate. Uh, most of the housing finance agencies were, were finding their funding cut or wanting the, the state wanting to put money into other areas. And um, we, did, we, we were closing probably two or three uh, new construction or rehabilitation projects a month. And for nine months, we closed nothing. And we sat down as a staff and said, well, what are we going to do? And uh, really, what all, what, really what we did is we, we planned for the future, so we, we kept our core competencies in place. And then we basically began to cut out what we considered to be uh, the growth in the organization. And I think we eliminated probably a dozen, dozen and a half facility, uh, FTEs. And in reality, I think there were only four people that we laid off. We just moved people around in the organization as, as spots became available. And I think there were only four individuals that I can think of that actually got laid off in that process. And most all of them got jobs almost immediately after uh, uh, they lay left here. Mm, I know that it was, it was a real concern what was going to happen to people here. We uh, cut all raises for a year. Uh, it was uh, it was difficult times. We're not sure what was going to happen. Eventually, the TARP money came in uh, and got applied to, to housing uh, and to get some of the construction started. And that needed to be put in place pretty quickly. As the government was trying to you know, trying to get that in place pretty quickly. And as soon as that uh, was put in place, I, I can tell you that a couple of the states actually called us up and said, "How would you go about doing this?" And we told them the real uh, the real uh, shared with them. Look, don't screw up the marketplace. Don't, uh, if the investor still wants to invest in a, you know, in a facility, even though the investment rates instead of a 4% may now be at 8, don't mess that up. Just support the 8% here until this market comes back. Mm -hmm. And within a, about three years, it came back. I, I think the state housing finance agencies got pretty smart about not building new product and rehabilitating the old, taking what was abandoned out there and trying to do something with it rather than, and then trying to, uh, again, kind of screw up the marketplace, if you know what I mean. Well, it'd be interesting to get Tom's perspective on this as well, as, as well as mine. But I, I think we've kind of always been the yin and the yang. You know, he's the kind of the aggressive, entrepreneurial type, uh, big picture guy. Um, he certainly understands and, and knows and has a grasp on, on the details, but I think details really bore him. Mm -hmm. And uh, details are kind of what I'm all about. And uh, whereas he wants it all done yesterday, I'm willing to take the month to get it done right. Uh, I can tell you when... Uh, when, he, when, when I took over development, which has probably got to, got to be 20 years ago now, um, the, guy, the, the gentleman who was uh, running development at the time left and went to the state of Indiana to run the tax credit program for them. And he walked into my, he quit on, I think, a Thursday. Uh, and Tom walked in my office on Friday and he lays a whole stack of uh, paperwork on my desk. He says, here, you read this this weekend. You're closing it on Monday. And uh, that's kind of how I got introduced to development. And uh, it closed about a month later, about 30 days later. But it, well, that was the kind of, kind of typical reaction of Tom. Here, you're going to close this on Monday, and it takes about 30 days to get the details done and the paperwork done, and we did the closing. But that's kind of the typical type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he makes friends with the people down the state of uh, the city of Columbus. They want to do an affordable housing facility in the northwest side of Columbus. He f finds a piece of ground and, you know, thinks we're going to close in a month and, you know, a year and a half later we actually build the project. So uh, that's Abbey, Tr Abbey Church Village. But uh, that's the kind of thing I think that you'll see between us. I tend to be, uh, tend to be much more slow and much more methodical uh, about getting things done. And he's the entrepreneur and that's what it takes to run an organization. Mm -hmm. I think it takes those folks who are or say asking why it wasn't done five years ago or why it wasn't done five minutes ago and the other people sit back and say let's take the time let's get this done and let's get it done right and uh, I think that's the way we've been uh, some some people tell the story about me being the kind of the buffer I don't know whether I'm really a buffer or not but I, I think that I tend to tend to, uh, uh, to appreciate what people do. Tom appreciates it too. And then he's on to the next deal. I tend to like to appreciate it maybe just a little longer than he does. <laughs> there have been a lot of people who are central uh, to what we've done in, in, in the different roles that they've had over the years. You know, the Board of Trustees, where do you find a board who literally is Central Ohio, Southern Ohio oriented that is willing to go national to get things done? Uh, you know, that takes some pretty entrepreneurial people on the board. 
I've had some great um, uh, finance chairs over the years who've helped us design financial statements to make, uh, make things more meaningful. My first finance chair said to me, if you can't explain to the board in, in a one-page memo where the financials are, uh, don't present them at all. So you'll notice my financial report is one page long, a memo, and uh, three schedules behind it. Uh, pretty, pretty bare bones. Uh, the schedules that are actually behind it were designed by the Audit Committee in, in co cooperation with them. Dick Miser uh, was my uh, uh, finance chair for a number of years. Uh, we really worked on getting those financials so they were understandable. Uh, I think of uh, Tom Reynolds was probably my first uh, Audit Committee chair. Uh, Ken Pierce, Ron Adams in particular, I think are just guys that have been just excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, individuals there. And uh, it really helped with the understanding of the financials. John Jones used to pick my financials apart all the time, uh, but I really appreciated him and, and, and his input over the years. Employees, Jane Simmons was my uh, treasurer for years, did a wonderful job uh, really building the financial structure and the financial system by which we do our financial statements. Uh, Doug Vesey has been here for years as my, my right hand, my controller. Um, I can tell you that when Tom dropped that facility on me, uh, Argus Green, uh, a number of years ago and uh, got me started in the development side, uh, we talked about what was going to happen and how I could continue to be involved in development. I said, you know, Doug's sitting here. Doug will take care of it. Doug will do all your reporting. And if you'll learn to trust him like you've learned to trust me over the years, uh, we'll be just fine in that area, and I'll, I'll take on the development side of the, of, of the business. So Doug's been great. Um, you know, of course, Tom, the staff we've got here today, Mark, Michelle, Jerry Cuiat, who just left, Joe Whiteman, who's taken his place, Terry Alton, uh, Dave Kayuha. I mean, you take a look at that, that group of people. They all come with, with great skills and, and great abilities, and, uh, you know, if uh, we'll all learn to trust what they do and what they do and do well, this organization is going to do great. You sit down in, in, in the process of, of doing your daily routine work and knowing that you got to come up with an audited set of financial statements, but you got to come up with reports that are meaningful. And you sit down and you, you recognize that you've got uh, an organization that started out with four facilities and suddenly they get to 40 and suddenly they get to 100 and suddenly they get to 200. You've got to have some sort of system by which everything is measured and measured really pretty quickly so that the bad boys stick out and yes there will be bad boys and yes there are bad boys <laughs> and there have been bad boys over the years but you just you've got to uh, to, to build it so that's understandable for the staff uh, in the early days it was kind of a mom and pop that ran the facilities it literally was retired couples who tended to, to run our facilities you had to create a set of financial statements that they could understand and, and, a, and, a, and a set of um, standards that they could live up to and understand in whether they were meeting them or not meeting them very quickly. We've always tried to keep that in place. And then how do you tell the board how 300 properties are being managed? Being managed? And we don't treat our managed facilities ever, any different than we do our own facilities. They're all run through the same process and the same standards. And over the years, there's been all sorts of new technology put in place to deal with certifications and recertifications, to deal with um, uh, uh, all of the operating guidelines and rules that uh, the different bureaucracies have, and they're different. The tax credit uh, certification is different than the Section 8 certification, and yet sometimes you've got to do both of them on a facility. And so how do you monitor that all that's getting done, done timely, uh, you're getting your funds in timely in order that pay the bills because, you know, we all want to eat, we all want our paycheck. Moving outside of Ohio, uh, uh, first of all, how do you go about moving outside of Ohio? When you have a staff of 50 people or, or a staff of even 100 people, how do you begin to move outside of Ohio? Well, we did it all with consultants. So on most of these applications, though we put them together, they were they really were done outside of Ohio by a consultant outside of Ohio. So you talk about great people that helped us out, the great consultants that we've used over the years, you know. But when you sit down and you, you begin to think about how to take this to another state, and we're kind of struggling right now with taking health care to another state, you got to understand those state rules, those state laws, the way that HUD office works, the way that bureaucracy you know, works in that state. A uh, fun little story is uh, uh, John Glenn decided uh, outside of Tom and I many years ago that we would put an application in, in Puerto Rico. 
And of course, Tom got back finding out that John had agreed to do this Puerto Rico project. Tom was out in California. Well, he did a quick look to see that it's just as far to go to California as it is to go to as it is to go to Puerto Rico. So that got him a little more calm. Plus, it was only two time zones away, not not or one one or two time zones away, not three time zones away. So he got a little more comfortable with it. Uh, we didn't take Spanish classes, though. Most people in Puerto Rico understand English, but that's how we actually got. You want to call it international? Uh, whether you consider Puerto Rico international. But all of these things take a system by which you can monitor the progress of facility here in Columbus, Ohio, that may be in Puerto Rico, in California, in Washington or Idaho, uh, wherever they would be in the state. So we're now in 27 states in Puerto Rico. And the board got a little nervous when we first started doing that and actually had uh, the auditors come in and, and do a, 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 a uh, operational review of the organization and kind of signed off that they thought we had the capability of doing this or I don't think we'd be where we are today. What fun story I can tell about this. We, want, we wanted to um, take Bristol Village and make it into a total continuing care retirement facility. The only thing at Bristol Village when I got here were 400 individual homes and an activity center. We didn't even have an activities director. All the activities were run by the residents, and by the way, still are down at Bristol Village. Um, but some of the residents down there, when I first arrived, uh, were running out of money. And so we built Bristol Court. Section 8 uh, a subsidy on a uh, rural development facility. So the loan was with Farmers Home Administration, and the, the, the rental subsidy was with HUD. Well, yeah, running out of money is one thing, running out of health is another. So when people no longer could care for themselves in a house or now in, in, in Bristol Court, where were they going to go? And, and it was really felt by the staff here in Columbus that we ought to uh, uh, put in a health care facility. Um, we first started talking about doing it, there was a lot of resistance because the people at Bristol Village were really, really, really independent. And so we actually looked for property off the campus and we put a couple of applications in and we did not win. And uh, we were very disappointed. I can re remember some arguments uh, about why it is we weren't getting it, but, but in reality it was pretty political down in the southern part of the state. So we joined forces with the uh, providers who were providing uh, health care in the southern part of the state and actually won an application and decided to build the Bristol Village Convalescent Center, which is what it was called originally, on, uh, on the Bristol Village campus and uh, uh, did that in, in partnership with another group and then uh, after uh, two and a half years acquired the facility uh, for ourselves. What happened is uh, during the, the, the late 80s in the Reagan administration they began to cut back on the funding for the Section 202 program which did most, which is how we developed most of our uh, affordable housing. And so little by little that uh, loan program became a grant program and little by little that grant program got less and less and less and less funding. And so we suddenly moved then to doing tax credits. Now, tax credits don't have that deep subsidy where a person pays 30% of their income. Tax credits, the equity comes in and uh, subsidizes the um, capital side of the project so you have smaller loans. In some cases, some of our tax credit facilities don't have any loans at all on that. So that kind of began the move to mixed financing where we went away from the deep subsidy to a lower level subsidy and even some market rate housing in your tax credit program. Um, First Community Village is, was a real leap from all that. So here you sit with a nice facility at uh, Riverside Drive and Fifth Avenue and of course you're aware that at Fifth Avenue and uh, Olentangy River Road on the other end of uh, Fifth Avenue or on another end of Fifth Avenue there on the Grandview side of things, uh, we have a homeless housing facility. Boy, you talk about a real dichotomy and a, and a real leap and a real, real jump. Well, the first community village went through a restructuring of um, their campus and they tore down a couple of old buildings and built a new facility. But in the process of that redevelopment of the property, they got into financial trouble. And I will tell you that it was a combination of the 2008 economy, a combination of not being, not doing a very good job of monitoring their construction uh, process. Uh, they ended up with a, a big lawsuit from the contractor 
and ended up uh, really not being able to pay their bills. And so uh, the financial institutions that were involved uh, with First Community Village encouraged them to find a management company to help them take them through reorganization. And uh, they interviewed a number of organizations and uh, National Church residents, whose our offices are about seven miles away from uh, the community, uh, to take them through a plan of reorganization. Uh, and it was supposed to be kind of a pre-packaged plan that the banks all agreed to. So we stepped in as the management company uh, to go through this process. Uh, one of the banks in the um, group of banks that uh, were involved in the financing wouldn't no longer uh, agree to the plan of reorganization uh, that had been put forth. So we had to literally go through uh, bankruptcy and file Chapter 13 and, and, and work through all of that. And on the back side of that Chapter 13, National Church Residences became the sole owner of First Community Village. And uh, I'm proud to say that last year we were able to re refinance uh, the debt with those four banks and I think put uh, First Community Village on a very solid financial footing uh, for the future. Um, well, let me start with my worst days, okay, because the best days really come out of the worst days, okay? You know, the worst days I think that you have in this job, first of all, I, I, I'm one of these people who live by the 80-20 rule. If it's good 80% of the time, you better keep the job, and they pay you for the other 20%. And of course, 20% of, of the things that happen to you take 80% of your time, and 80% of the things that happen take 20% of your time. So I'm kind of a firm believer in that, and I'll tell you, life around here has been, been good much more than 80% of the time. But I think the two toughest moments that I think that, that I've experienced at National Church Residences, and one of them affected me a lot more than the other, I, I think the toughest thing that we went through was when, when the HUD folks really thought, uh, and they, they, they sent a study in here to find out whether this organization was really uh, a good organization, really up to snuff, really wasn't violating their, 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 uh, their rules and regulations. And they came in here and they found 31 areas, I think, that. They, they, they really thought we violated some of their rules and regulations and somehow were, were bad folks stealing money and not, not following the rules and that kind of thing. And, and uh, over a five or six year process, Mark Ricketts just did an excellent job uh, in this organization, a lot of other people, pulling together the, the information, the details, and in the end, uh, we were very much commended. And so my worst day was the day that they said they were going to come in here and the days that they came in here and thought we were you know, the worst people on earth, and I think the best days were, one of the best days was when they came in and said, and literally thanked us for going through the process uh, with them and changed a lot of their rules to match up, and I think uh, come to those days. Another one of my worst days uh, was the, going, the, the day, of, and the, the actual process of going through the bankruptcy with First Community Village. Sitting there and being deposed for two days, uh, uh, about the, the, the organization, National Church Residences, First Community Village. I mean, I had migraine headache, you know, working through all of that. And one of the best days is when we emerged from bankruptcy with an organization that I think uh, is, is on good financial footing. Uh, we protected the, uh, uh, the, the leases, the life leases of the residents. We protected uh, uh, the, res the, the, the residents and the staff there at First Community Village and, and came out owning that project and then to be able to refinance it uh, two and a half years, two years, two and a half years before we're required to do that, to get the banks out and to really put it on so solid financial footing, uh, I think for the next 40 years, that had to, was one of the better days of my life. So the worst days, the best days, they always go together. So it's, it's an opportunity in work clothes mm -hmm. when you get a problem around here. And uh, it is really great when you, when you solve that problem or solve that issue. We've had a few other, a few other ones like that. I remember taking over Portage Trail Village. Mm -hmm. I remember going up to the HUD office uh, with, with the question really literally being posed in my face, who the hell are you and what the hell are you doing involved in this, in this building? I remember walking out of there with a migraine headache, uh, trying to convince them that I've been trying to acquire this building properly for two and a half years and uh, I was accused of never having sent a piece of paper into the place. Uh, uh, I think we solved that building and I think Portage Trail Village is a, is a real asset in the community to now as well as the Bath Road uh, uh, healthcare facility. But those would be some of the ones that I think were tougher and I think today you could sit back and say it was just an opportunity and work close. 
First of all, I say this is a great place to work. I know you're not supposed to say that in videos, that it's a great place to work because it raises everybody's expectations. There will be those days and there will be those things that will happen because you know what happens. I can't say that on video, but you know what happens. You know, it's stuff just happens. Get together, find the folks that are involved, and get together and work it out. There isn't anything this organization can't do if you get the right people in the right room with the right discussion all working together to solve a problem. And we have plenty of them. I've been in development now for 20 years, and I will tell you, it happens all the time. You get facilities where they find termite damage, and you've got to change your, your timing. You find uh, walls that don't have, uh, that don't have uh, fire breaks between apartments when you're doing rehab, and you sit there and say, how did this happen, and how are we going to come up with a couple hundred thousand dollars it's going to take to fix this? But if you get everybody in the room sitting down, staff, um, even some of your consultants, some of the folks you work with, you'll find the solution and we'll make it work. I mean, it's about the people. It's about Mr. and Mrs. Jones who live in that apartment or, you know, Mrs. Smith who's all alone at 90 years old and needs a little help. It's about people. It's not about the building. It's not about the paperwork. It's not about the schedules. It's not about getting the checks out on time or, or even getting the revenue necessarily on time. You heard that from an accountant. You should never hear that from an accountant, but it really is about the people. Uh, trust the folks that work with you and, and work together to get it done.